than the grave. We for the erring one lift up the fallen. Tell them of Jesus the mighty to save. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Down in the human heart, crushed by the tempter, feelings lie burden that grace can restore. Touched by a loving heart, wakened by kindness, chords that are broken will vibrate once more. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is wonderful, Jesus will save. Rescue the perishing, duty demands it. Strength for thy labor the Lord will provide. Back to the narrow way, patiently win them. Tell the poor wanderer a Savior has died. Rescue the perishing, care for the dying. Jesus is merciful, Jesus will save. Good morning. Wonderful to be with you again in worship. Thank you to Lydia and Martin for helping us come into the presence of God with song this morning. I want to share with you from Matthew chapter 22, verses 1 through 14. Once more Jesus spoke to them in parables, saying, The kingdom of heaven may be compared to a king who gave a wedding banquet for his son. He sent his slaves to call those who had been invited to the wedding banquet, but they would not come. Again he sent other slaves, saying, Tell those who have been invited, Look, I've prepared my dinner, my oxen. My fat calves have been slaughtered. Everything is ready. Come to the wedding banquet. But they made light of it and went away, one to his farm, another to his business, while the rest seized his slaves and mistreated them and killed them. The king was enraged. He sent his troops, destroyed those murderers, and burned their city. And then he said to his slaves, The wedding is ready, but those invited were not worthy. Go, therefore, into the main streets. Invite everyone you find to the wedding banquet. Those slaves went out to the streets. They gathered all whom they found, both good and bad. So the wedding hall was filled with guests. But when the king came to see the guests, he noticed a man there who was not wearing a wedding robe. He said to him, Friend, how did you get in here without a wedding robe? And he was speechless. Then the king said to the attendants, Bind him hand and foot, throw him into the outer darkness, where there will be weeping and gnashing of teeth. For many are called, but few are chosen. The word of God for the people of God. Thanks be to God. This is the kind of parable that could become the basis of a modern movie, really. There's all sorts of sordid characters, and there's plenty of violence. And in the end, you're wondering what it was really all about. Imagine what that movie might look like. Probably takes place in New Orleans. The opening scene would introduce some of the key characters uh, smoking cigars in a back room and making plans to take advantage of the failing businesses and government handouts after the most recent hurricane. Deferring, of course, to the man at the end of the table who's clearly the head of the organization, and you get this sense that this is probably a syndicated crime organization. In the next scene, you realize that the head of the organization is also well-known and well-respected member of the community. Now, maybe he's the mayor or a member of city council, or, or perhaps he's just the owner of a company that employs most of the people in the city. You see him leading camera crews and reporters on tours of all the devastation. And you now know that the central figure in the movie is he's a mover and a shaker in more than one sense of the word. And you recognize that these two worlds are really not so separate. Everyone everywhere knows who he is 
and how important he is. Now we get to the twist. His daughter wants to get married, but because of the hurricane, there is no guarantee of a place for the event. And because of his prospective son-in-law's traveling schedule, regular trips to South America for business, they're not even sure when to plan this wedding. So the key operator, whatever his name is, he, he puts out the word, both publicly, overtly, as well as privately and covertly. He tells everyone his daughter will be getting married, and he expects his longtime supporters to be there. I'll give you the details later, but plan to attend. Well, things begun to come together rather suddenly. One of the major hotels finally reopens and no one has scheduled the ballroom for the first weekend. And both the bride and the groom are going to be in town, so, and, and so will he. So he puts out the word on Tuesday, the wedding is going to be this Friday. Well, most of the people laugh it off. Who in the right minds can expect to cancel all other engagements to be at a wedding in just four days? Some laughed at the messengers. Some laughed over the phone. Some even jokingly pushed the messengers out the door. He can't be serious. It's the most common response. Now, there were a few accidents along the way. One of the messengers fell down some stairs and broke his leg. Another messenger was interrupting an important meeting, but they thought he was an intruder and shot him. And by Thursday, the big guy is furious. He, he's hired hitmen to take care of a few people. They were the people he really didn't like anyway. There were several suspicious-sounding fires in a few of the building locations, and, and he found ways to have others fired from their positions. He made life miserable for most of the people who had known him, people he thought were his friends. But there's still a wedding to be planned. He needed to have some guests, so he went and sought out people, and he went to the schools, and he had messengers go to the malls and to the evacuation centers, inviting people, anyone. He brought some radio ad space. He made public invitations. Y'all come celebrate. And when the day of the wedding arrives, there's a large crowd. Everything seems to be going along fine. Everything is fine, that is, until the father notices a man in a 7-Eleven t-shirt. And after a short discussion with the man, he, he has him thrown out of the party. He isn't just politely escorted to the door, mind you. He is physically carried to the fire escape stairwell where he is tossed down the stairs, and he tumbles down all 19 floors. And the movie ends with a picture of the dying man in his 7-Eleven t-shirt while the wedding music plays above. I know there's people who would pay to see that movie, uh, there's people that would pay to see any movie in the theater right now. And I also believe critics would wonder, what was that movie about? What did we just see? Is there a point to the story, or is it just a story of power and politics? Same questions could be asked of this parable. That in some ways, it's the same story. I have to confess to you, I, I don't like the way this parable reads. It's all too clear the king in the parable is God, and I don't like the way that God is portrayed. The king is too harsh, too unforgiving. And I especially don't like the way that the man is treated who came to the wedding without the proper attire. They found him in the streets, after all. What did they expect? It reminds me a little of the class wars set up in Titanic, the movie. You remember it? The main subplot, the love story between the very poor Jack Dawson and the very well thought of, though actually broke, we learn, Rose. In one scene, Jack the poor man is even fitted with a fancy suit so he can attend dinner with the well-to-do folks. Even Jack knows that you don't go to a fancy meal like that without the proper attire. But he isn't one of the well-to-do folks. 
And he's chased out when he's recognized as the ruffian that he is. Dressing up, it doesn't change who he is any more than dress changed Cinderella. Her dress simply allowed others to see who she really was. Imagine a young girl like one I knew in my first appointment. She loved new clothes. Kimmy would, would always put on her new clothes and ask me and anyone else if they thought she looked pretty. For some reason, she didn't think she looked pretty in the old clothes, but I would always tell her she looked pretty no matter what she was wearing. But then one day I thought of another response. When she showed me a new dress, I said to her, Kimmy, you make that dress look beautiful. It wasn't and it isn't what we wear that's important. It's what we are underneath our clothes that matters the most. But we're usually the last ones to believe that. We in the church, we're, we're probably better known for standards of dress than any other place. Some em employers and schools do have strict dress codes, but they're open and upfront about it. Some even put restrictions on hairstyles. We in the church wouldn't go for that, would we? Aren't we known to have Sunday go to meet and close? Because if you think about it, you'd probably agree that there is an unwritten dress code in church. Sometimes parents enforce it, but more often than not, the rest of us give subtle but clear indications of what is acceptable and what is not. No sequin dresses here. No tuxedos allowed, but no cut-off shorts either. Why? It isn't our clothes that matter, or is it? A man gets thrown out of the wedding feast because he isn't wearing the proper attire, but the true attire for the Christian has nothing to do with what we wear. It has everything to do with what we are. It's when we put on costumes and pretend to be something else that we forget what God has created us to be. When we wear clothes to impress others, we've forgotten that God is the only one whose approval we need. And if we come to the wedding feast under false pretenses, whether we are looking for free food or a chance to meet people, there is nothing we can wear that will be right for the occasion. God's going to throw us out, whether we like it or not. Because you see, it's God's party. It's God's grace. It's God's invitation to us all. And the clothes we're wearing just don't matter. What does matter is how we choose to respond to the invitation. There's a wedding garment in your size waiting to be worn by you. And while no fashion show on earth can depict it, that wedding garment will change the way you see the world. It's the garment of salvation. As the guy in that movie I described earlier said, come, celebrate. God has the party planned and you have been invited. Thanks be to God. Amen. I want to share with you um, a bit of prayer time, as we often like to do. And I'll have a few announcements for you after that. Join me in a time of prayer. God, we come into your presence this day. We come with praise and thanksgiving for your faithful love. God, your love never fails, not even when we turn away from you or when we ignore your invitation or, or desert you for gods of our own making. God, even then, you don't abandon us, but you reach out again and again, inviting us back into relationship. And God, as you welcome us, we know that you welcome our prayers. We, we bring them to you with confidence, knowing that you can and will hear us. We, we pray for the world that you created, God. We pray for the people who share it with us. We pray for countries caught up in war 
for violent conflict. We, we pray for regions of the world that are struggling with increased cases of COVID-19. We pray for those whose homes and lives are threatened by natural disaster. And for these and all the other areas in our world where there is need, God, we ask you to hear our prayer today. God, we pray for our country and for her people. We pray for our government leaders, both here in Scottsville and Allen County and in our state and, and for our president. We pray for our judicial system. We pray for our police and our military. We pray for our cities and our rural communities, for employers and employees, for young and for old, for all who make up this great country. Lord, we pray. We pray for people here in Scottsville. We pray for people who are unemployed. We pray for those who are in, in jail. We pray for the hungry. We pray for those who are alone or afraid. We pray for our neighbors, the ones we know and the ones we don't know. And God, we pray for this congregation. We pray for our brothers and sisters in Christ. Some who we see each week and some who we know are at home. God, we pray for those who are ill or with loved ones who are ill. We pray for those who are anxious about the future. We pray for those who are struggling with their faith and for, pray for those who are strong and minister among us. For all your people in this place, God, we ask your mercy and for you to hear our prayer. God, pour out your spirit on us. Fix our hearts and minds on what is true and honorable and right. God, give us the joy and the peace that comes from knowing and doing your will. Keep us faithful. Keep us faithful to your call, which has been received in Jesus. Help us to extend your loving invitation to all the world around us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. I want to remind you that uh, Saturday is our centennial celebration out at uh, Dumont Hill at Dugas Park in the Amphitheater. Uh, seven will be in concert for an afternoon of uh, joy and good music and uh, in worship, really. Invite you to come. We'll have uh, gators and go-karts to help get folks from the parking lot down to the seating area if you need it. Uh, if you have a lawn chair and want to bring it, and you know, come and get comfortable. It's going to be outside, lots of space between people. Uh, but I invite you to come and enjoy. We're selling our, our new ornaments to commemorate our 100 years. They're, you can call the church office, or we will have them that day as well. And then lastly, just as a reminder, as the weather is getting colder, uh, we will be moving worship uh, to inside the sanctuary. And when we do that, uh, we will be... The video that you'll be able to see will be the live stream that we will put out, a live stream of our service on Sunday morning that then you can watch later in the day and throughout the week. It's good to be with you, and I know you'll enjoy uh, this next song from Lydia and Martin. Sowing in the morning, sowing seeds of kindness, sowing in Come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Going forth with weeping, sowing for the master. Though the loss sustained, our spirit often grieves. When our weeping's over, he will bid us welcome. We shall come rejoicing, bringing in the sheaves. Bringing in the sheaves. Bringing in the sheaves, we shall come rejoicing. Bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, bringing in the sheaves, we shall.
shall come rejoice. 